For the past couple of years, the WWE has really put forth this concerted effort to try and make SummerSlam the WrestleMania of the summer. Like all of a sudden, a lightning bolt shot straight up their ass and said, Hey, this show's been around almost 30 damn years. It's our biggest show of the summer. Why not make it feel like a WrestleMania type event? It almost seems sensible in the logic, doesn't it? Well, what does that really mean? What does that really mean? Unfortunately, when it comes to the WWE, what it means when you take SummerSlam and try to make it your WrestleMania of the summer is you take a bunch of lame, kind of bland, boring characters that all kind of act in uh, the same and wrestle the same and put them in uninteresting stories, culminating with crappy, long, spot-fest matches where really they follow three simple philosophies in said matches. They're floppy, they're choppy, and they're sloppy. Ironically, this could be the names of some of the hood rats I've dated in the past, but I digress! These matches ultimately culminate in no real payoff whatsoever, making you sit and look at your watch and say, oh my god, why did I waste all of this time? This show was way too damn long, way too damn boring, and way too little actually happened of any consequence, and ultimately I felt like I wasted my goddamn time. It perfectly epitomizes the WWE. It's what you feel like you get a lot of years now out of WrestleMania, so why the hell shouldn't that pattern, trend of pathetic behavior carry over to the summer? Whoa, man! That's what it is. God only knows. Ugh. What the hell some of the hardcore fans' reactions have been to SummerSlam? I try not to pay attention. I try not to look. Because... I didn't want to fucking know. I could just think of it. And I can imagine it. And oh my god. This show was not good. So it's far from the worst WWE show I've ever seen. Let's get that out of the equation. There was the occasional highlight or positive moment here. But unfortunately, those were fleeting and too few and far between. And this largely felt like a show as referenced earlier, with a bunch of lame, boring characters involved in uninteresting, poorly developed stories, resulting in build-up to matches that were long and floppy and choppy and sloppy spot fest that had no real payoff, and it all feels like a giant waste of fucking time. I probably go in even more hardcore on this damn show, and it suck factor if it wasn't the part that I hadn't watched much over the past couple of months. I got a little bit of a break. So yeah, I'm going to rant and rave and scream about how shitty this show was, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it to the same level that the show probably freaking deserves. Ding dong, dumb dicks, if you think this show was good, what the fuck were you smoking? And furthermore, whatever ganja or stickiest of the ekes you were smoking, can you please pass that fatty this way? Because God knows I need it to enjoy this shit. Now, anytime this company wants to start off a show with Enzo Amore and Colin Cassidy is just fine with me. These two dudes are entertaining as fuck. They don't even need to wrestle to entertain me. And sometimes I wish they didn't wrestle, that they would just make appearances, because that could be damn near worth the price of admission in and of itself. And as long as the company doesn't screw them up, these guys should be entertaining us for months to come. Of course, they ultimately are going to, because Vince someday is going to sit there and have an epiphany. And he's going to look at Colin Cassidy, and he says, You know what? He should be an ass-eating zombie! And then Kevin Dunn's going to say... Vince says, I've just had a masterstroke of brilliance. How about Enzo Amore becomes a ballerina dancer afflicted with popcorn farts? Oh, Vince, Vince, carrots, carrots. You know they're going to do it. We're going to fucking ruin these guys, so let's enjoy it while we can. It's just a shame that this spotlight here which is a spot on the SummerSlam card, your WrestleMania of the summer, and we're having them work against 
Jericho or whatever the fuck you're calling him. This is the type of match that points out just how poorly the WWE plans things out. You've been building Kevin Owens, building Kevin Owens to a point where if they put him in one of those two title matches on this card, I'm not flinching. I'm not batting an eye at it. To me, it makes sense. And it most certainly is better a choice than putting Dolph Ziggler or Finn fucking Balor in those spots. But no! We put him here in the opening fucking match of the card. And then to top it all off, we've got Enzo and Cassidy eating the loss here, and it's Jericho fucking going over. This shit makes absolutely no fucking sense, just so that way, eight days later, Kevin Owens could be the fucking new WWE Universal whatever the fuck champion on a fuck-off Raw instead of getting a big spotlight moment here that could make a star at SummerSlam because this company is fucking stupid. Speaking of WrestleMania, all the stars were aligned at that show. You have a long-reigning women's champion. You're talking about this Divas Revolution. You have the most popular babyface diva in Sasha Banks. In the title match at Mania, her, her family, her cousin Snoop, is leading her down to the damn ring. It's all there. Put the goddamn belt on her, but no! Had to keep the belt on fucking boring-ass Charlotte. So that way, later on down the road, we can eventually give that spot that moment to Sasha Banks, instead of it being at the most important show of the year in WrestleMania, we do it on a fuck-off Raw, to now she gets to a significant title defense in her career at one of your biggest shows of the year, the WrestleMania of the summer in SummerSlam, and lo and behold, wouldn't you know, fucking she's dropping the strap back to Charlotte. Like, I was sitting there watching, and it legitimately looked like when Sasha was coming down to the ring, she was pissed. And you buy and believe that injury bullshit all you wanted to. Charlotte out politically played her here, period, and you could see it on Sasha's face. And it's a shame because, frankly, a lot of the matches involving Charlotte were, were harken back to what I said at the beginning of this review floppy, choppy, and sloppy, and goddamn boring. And that's exactly what this shit was. The match stunk, the finish is stupid, and instead of giving somebody like Sasha that spotlight and that moment, they just had to give it some flair. Woo! <laughs> Let's give it up for Ric Flair with a lady penis! You know, I always have an appreciation for The Miz because he's one of the few performers in the company that can actually elicit the reaction out of the audience that he's freaking supposed to. And that is a lost art in today's business, believe me, and you see this all the time. The Miz can be an MVP for the WWE. He can get himself over... He can get other people over. He can be a great resource. Instead, they stick Maurice with them, and instead of her being the heater in the sense of everybody's pissed at the Miz because he can get with Maurice when, you know, frankly, all you need to bring is a platter of German chocolate cake and a twenty bag, twenty dollar bag of Coke, and she's probably all yours. You know, they use her in a way that it's just kind of like, ugh. you know, so it, it, they could do so much more. And then you, speaking of so much more. You've got freaking Apollo Crews. He can be more. When I see what they're doing with him, it's clear that they have no real direction for him. What he reminds me of right now is what CM Punk was in back like fucking 2008. I know they're different talents, different performers, different personalities. What I'm referencing is, is how bore the brakes off of you boring fucking CM Punk was back in 2008. Don't tell me that dude was entertaining. He fucking sucked. He was like the ultimate of vanilla, white meat, lame ass baby face. Later on down the road, they discovered he had some personality. And they decided to allow that personality to show. Just like he's going to be showing blood when he gets his ass kicked at UFC coming up. Nonetheless... I look at Apollo Crews, I keep almost wanting to say Terry Crews, and I don't know if this name is intentional, or this company is just that fucking stupid. They say, hey, Apollo Creed was black, Terry Crews is black, let's merge them together, and you've got the super duper black guy. They need to give him some type of gimmick, something, instead of just wasting him here in a mediocre-ass icy title match at SummerSlam. Heading up to SummerSlam, there was only one match that I was looking forward to in the sense that I thought it had a lot of elements going for it 
and it could really deliver and really be a highlight of the night. While there's some interest in terms of the story between Orton and Brock Lesnar, I knew what path that was going to head down and how that was going to disappoint and piss me off. And more on that later. But AJ Styles versus John Cena had so many coals in the fire to me to really make this inferno of awesome. And I, I was looking forward to a John Cena match more than any match on this card. It's how sad the state of this company has gotten. It just... <laughs> and, you know, Brock, bless John's heart. You know, he, he's been gone. <laughs> Sometimes it's like he can't win for trying, even when he tries to add new um, moves to his skill set. that He usually botches them and they look bad. But you got to give the guy something for trying, don't you? Don't you? I guess but AJ Styles, John Cena, the story's there, the characters are there, the spot is there. Unfortunately, this match was buried in the middle of the fucking show. This match should have been later on in the night, and you could have made the argument, because of the participants involved, that it maybe should have been the main event of the night. And looking back, it most certainly deserved to be, because for all intents and purposes, it was nighty-night time after this on this goddamn show. AJ Styles, John Cena, really, really good. Hats off to both of these guys. I thought they told a really good story. I really enjoyed this match. I dug the way that this was laid out. I thought it was perfect for what it needed to be. And AJ Styles going over clean in the way that he did, you know, it worked. Everything about this worked. I really, really enjoyed this. And my hat's off to both of them. And I have to say, I was really pleasantly surprised that John Cena put over AJ Styles at SummerSlam. I don't know if this was the WWE choosing to punish Cena because he's daring to venture out and host the ESPYs and be on the Today Show and shit. You know, if you're in the mood to punish people, why don't you punish the guy that took estrogen blockers before us fighting you at Feature 200? Assholes. But nonetheless, now AJ Styles has something to hang his hat on. AJ Styles has something to brag about. That way, when he faces Dean Ambrose or somebody else and they fucking lose, he'd be like, well, we beat a guy who beat Cena, but we didn't beat Cena, and this is awesome. But for this one moment in time, AJ Styles versus John Cena by uh, question was my highlight of the night. I've been a fan of John Stewart for a number of years, and I always enjoyed his work on The Daily Show. With that said, I really didn't need him coming back and mingling on SummerSlam 2016 again. It's like the WWE was desperately seeking for the show to be as relevant as possible, and they thought he was another coal they could put into the fire, along with the appearances on ESPN and all this other stuff. And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Maybe Jon Stewart's just trying to have some fun and all the while do something a little bit different. I, I don't know. But, you know, when it comes to Jon Stewart, if there was ever a fucking election cycle that he needed to be doing The Daily Show, be on TV, it's this one. Because God knows we need him. And instead, for some particular reason, this numbnuts decided to walk away last year. And now it seems like he's desperately trying to get into the mix of relevancy because he realized the idiocy of his stupidity of leaving his goddamn show a year too early. Or maybe just the stupidity of this country and the fact of the two primary choices for president are who they are. You know what? In that case, I can't fucking blame him. His tag title match between the kid, these two bald headed fucking jobbers, <laughs> and, and Kofi and Xavier Woods. Uh, eh. The highlight was Big E. I'll put it that way. The highlight is Big E coming back. A tag title match at a big four pay per view that ends in a mo moshy smosh like this. It's whatever. Uh, Big E, 2017. Royal Rumble winner, Big E, WrestleMania 33, main eventer. You can take all your lame flipping midgets and shove them up your ass. You want to talk about change. You want to talk about a new era. You want to talk about somebody that, God forbid, can actually entertain you in a plethora of ways. Here he is. He's staring you right in your big fucking faces. Everything this company needs to do right now needs to be about getting Big E ready for that spotlight in 2017. And if they don't, shame fucking on them. 
You take a mid-carder who hasn't really progressed and improved over the past three and a half years and have him defend his title against a suspect-ass undercard guy who is at least five years past any relevancy that he might have ever fucking had to begin with. And ladies and gentlemen, what the hell do you get? You get the WWE Championship match at SummerSlam in the middle of the fucking card. Just think about this. One of the stupid things about the brand split is that you have two world titles. Ultimately means that one of those world titles by nature is not going to mean as much. Very good chance at certain shows it's going to mid-card or be very early on in the night. The ironic thing about this is, is this match most certainly didn't deserve to be any higher. And frankly, you could have just opened with this fucking match. But then that probably would have disappointed the people from the very beginning. To sit there and say that Dolph Ziggler versus Dean Ambrose for the WWE Championship was a disappointment would be a misstatement. And the simple reason being is that if you had any expectations for this match to be anything other than a boring, floppy snooze fest, then I don't know what the fuck you were expecting. I don't know what the fuck you were snorting, injecting, or smoking. Is if you really thought Dolph Ziggler versus Dean Ambrose was going to be a big time money pay per view match, you're just being stupid. Reaction to this match? Now, the crowd didn't seem to be bothered to have a reaction to this match. They were happier to see Nikki Bella, legitimately. Why should I have any reaction? Well, just one. <laughs> Fuck Dolph Ziggler! Oh, the Divas tag match. What more could be said? Six women showed up, kind of, sort of wrestled. More fans cared about Nikki Bella's return than they <laughs> did about Dolph Ziggler versus Dean Ambrose. And frankly, Finn Balor and Seth Rollins' match, let's be honest. Um, and Nikki Bella wins. Big surprise there. I really, from a statistic standpoint, wish Eva Marie wouldn't have gotten suspended here. Because this was going to be her spot. She was going to win this match and get this victory. <laughs> And then we get to the crowning achievement of shit of this night, maybe arguably until the main event of the night, the WWE Universal Championship match. It's Finn Balor versus Seth Rollins. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I'm celebrating. Where do I even begin with this steamy pile of shit? Let's start off with Seth Rollins. When are we going to start getting calls for this guy to get buried? How many people does he fucking have to hurt? How many times does he have to be fucking reckless in the spots that he does, in the way that he does them, how, why, when he does them, all of that shit, before people start to question why the hell he has this spot? I mean, seriously. Why the hell isn't this guy getting buried? Effectively ended uh, frickin' Sting's career. Remember I busted up Cena's goddamn nose? I can't even remember. I'm sure he's fucked up other people, too. And then you see Finn Balor. You can talk about what he turned. And that's what... The point is, if the fucking curb stomp move, or whatever the hell you want to call it, was banned, why the hell is this buckle bomb still allowed? And why is Seth Rollins still doing it, knowing that when he does it, people get fucking hurt? You stupid son of an Iowa bitch! You're in the big leagues now. You're not at the fucking bingo halls in front of 25 people working for 20 bucks a night. You're not fucking Tyler Black carrying the ROH world title for 75 bucks a night. You're in the big leagues now. You're supposed to be a professional. Start acting like it. And if you can't get yourself over and get your matches to flow and work without resorting to these reckless, shitty spots, then you don't deserve your spot. And frankly, you don't deserve a goddamn job with the company. He should be fired. I'm sorry. You think that's crazy? Fucking doesn't matter. It's not like the dude's over anyways. It's not like anybody on this fucking roster is really truly over any goddamn ways. They're all interchangeable, replaceable parts, which is exactly how Vince McMahon wants it at the end of the day. He doesn't want anybody bigger than the brand, bigger than the shield, if you will. Bigger than the company. Nobody is. Seth Rollins is fucking replaceable. Fucking CM Punk was replaceable. Daniel Bryan is repla was replaceable. Seth Rollins is replaceable too. 
You might think that they're not, but at the end of the day, they fucking are because they don't matter. But what does matter is when you eventually only have Seth Rollins in the main event picture because he's taken everybody fucking else out of action. Seriously, you've been doing it how many years? How could you not fucking do this shit right? Period. Unacceptable. You nerds that are going to sit there and defend him in the comments know that if Roman Reigns did this shit and hurt this many people, you'd be calling for his head. And you should. Because that's ridiculous. You're a professional. You only get to where you're at in part because of the people that you work with. You can't take care of the people you work with. You can't protect the people you work with. Brock Lesnar. Then you don't deserve your fucking spot. Period. Say that about anybody. And right now, Seth Rollins is a reckless piece of shit that deserves to be buried. Not sitting there and getting ready to work a program with God. Oh, God. Well, then Finn Balor. Let's not even get to this heaping piece of shit that was Finn Balor in a fucking world title match at SummerSlam. Have we really stooped to this level? Where these many hardcore fans are going to sit there and think this was something good? You want to know how this wasn't fucking good? Is You had more people, it seemed like, during the match worried about the shitty design of that Universal Championship, which looks like they took the WWE title and dipped it into menstrual sauce. That's what it looks like. Seriously. More people seem concerned and fascinated by that, especially early on in the match, than they did with the two guys in the match. Oh, let's take a look at Finn Balor. He's got the demon paint, he's got the entrance, and then once the match starts, he's just another fucking jabroni. You take your New Japan Bullet Club shit and shove it down your throat and straight up your ass, because it's true. Fucking boring as bricks. Actually, bricks have more entertainment value because you can watch the mortar dry and settle and see if they crack. And ah, shut the fuck up. Finn Balor. And people are happy about this asshole winning the fucking championship. Maybe someday when he's actually progressed up the card and you've actually built it up to a point in time where it actually would work. Okay, whatever. You fucks can have your moment. But right now, at this moment of time, no. And the fact that he got injured... I'm laughing my ass off about it because this is yet another example of when you let the hardcore fans dictate what the WWE does, it equates to disaster, and the WWE gets exactly what the fuck they deserve. They thought so much about these guys and this match that it didn't even main event your WrestleMania of the summer. In fact, it played opening act to Roman Reigns and Rusev or whatever the fuck that was in the U.S. title match. The company knew this was stupid, and they did it any fucking ways. And they got exactly what the fuck they deserved. You only get one chance to win your first title. And they wasted Finn Balor's here just so that way the next night he has to surrender the belt. And a week later, the guy who didn't even win the opening match of this major show is now the new fucking champion, and all of a sudden he's aligned with God. This company is stupid. Finn Balor being in this match was stupid. Finn Balor winning this title was fucking stupid. The design of the title is fucking stupid. Seth Rollins and everything about him right now and how reckless his ass is in the fucking ring is fucking stupid. The brand split is fucking stupid. And yes, this match was in large part fucking stupid. Who's good? Ah, shut the fuck up. You want know, to sit there and watch these type of matches? Go watch some shit on the internet. You know, go watch some eye pay per view crap. You know, the WWE is supposed to be big leagues. It's supposed to be bigger and better than this. And occasionally, every once in a while, I'd like it to be bigger and better than this. Speaking of wasting time and spinning their wheels, let's talk about Roman Reigns and Rusev. The same Roman Reigns that has main evented the last two WrestleManias is now sitting here and working a U.S. title match at SummerSlam. The, the, the lack of logical progression up and down the card is just astounding. The WWE is like a temperamental teenager, where all of a sudden, they're going out with somebody, and oh my god, it's the greatest thing ever, and that person, they love them, and they want to be with them forever, and they want to have babies together, and then the next week later, they fucking can't stand each other. 
This is the type of childish, petty shit that we're dealing with here when it comes to this company. You know, Roman Reigns is not worthy of a main event spot. I grant you. But they went there. If you go there, then you go all the fucking way there in the way that you did. He main evented two straight WrestleMania. You invested all that time and energy in him just to sit there and somewhat kind of quasi bury him here and waste him in this spot? Why? Because he took fucking Adderall? All the while, again, the estrogen blocker is main eventing this fucking show and boring the brakes off of people. Unfucking believable. And then Rusev. It took what was working in terms of the dynamic at one point in time, kind of going with this Yvonne Drago crap. I don't know what the fuck they've done with it now. They've got Lana sitting there instead of being like this strong, kind of in-charge, take-charge woman that people found kind of sexy and really got her over. Now they've almost made her into some type of sappy, subservient Russian mail-order bride. And I don't know what the fuck they're doing with Rusev. He's in the same goddamn spot he was two years ago. Absolutely no progression in his character, up or down. Same fucking spot. It's all a waste of time. I hope this is starting to sink in for all of you. I'm not even going to talk about this anymore. And then we get to the main event. Randy Orton versus Brock Lesnar. Fifteen years in the making is the billing. And in theory, this should be the type of of special attraction, semi-main event, or main event match that should be a foundation block of every SummerSlam. These two guys haven't faced each other one-on-one -on -one in a major pay-per-view. This is the type of match that should happen. These are the big shows that you save these type of matches for. You know, and Orton is one of those guys that even in recent years, they've kind of fallen off the Orton bandwagon sound. He's still somebody very quickly, the WWE can right the ship with him and make him into a very viable, credible challenger to Brock Lesnar from a WWE standpoint. And at the end of the day, you have one of the ultimate outs when it comes to Orton and Lesnar in this match. At some point in time, Lesnar's got to lose. At some point in time, you've got to shake shit up, mix shit up, and do something a little different and change the narrative of what you do with the conqueror, the beast incarnate, Brock Lesnar! You've got Randy Orton, the RKO out of nowhere. Literally, you can have Lesnar kick his ass 90% of the damn match. Orton hits one fucking lucky, spectacular RKO. One, two, three, wins. And now you can wait maybe a couple of months, go to Survivor Series or Royal Rumble, and then Lesnar can get his big revenge. Orton can have his comeuppance there. That's how you build a story. That's how you really take something here that could be something and make it into something even more instead of what the WWE does yet again, which is take something that could really be something and make it basically a big fat nothing. Nothing. Now let me get this straight. We suspend Titus O'Neil for 60 days because he grabs the boss's arm. We suspend Roman Reigns for 30 days because of Adderall making him surrender said title that he had and wasting him on this card against Rusev. We punished John Cena for doing all of this stuff on the outside of the company on his own by having him a uh, job clean to AJ Styles at SummerSlam, something five years ago would have been inconceivable to think about. And don't think it's all of a sudden John Cena just magically gets a sense of how this could help the business, give me a fucking break. You know there are more things at play here. There are more chess pieces being moved around behind the scenes than just that. You know that. Don't be stupid. But when we talk about stupid, it's the fact that this company would allow Brock Lesnar, after failing both his A sample and his B sample, the estrogen blocker himself, who is riding dirty as fuck, for UFC, all of a sudden, we're going to come up with this bullshit thing about how he's not a full-time employee of the company, even though technically, with the wrestlers all being independent contractors, having to provide themselves both health insurance and pay their full Social Security tax, you could argue that none of the WWE superstars are technically full-time employees of the company, hence the whole term of independent contractors. Why the fuck would you even have a wellness policy then? But I digress, because I could go off on a whole big soapbox forever. But here's a moment to send Lesnar a message. Here's a moment to send 
the rest of the roster and the locker room the message that no matter who you are, no matter how big your name is, no matter how much we feature you on the marquee or the spotlight, nobody is above the law. And when it comes to the WWE of today and the way that Vince has cultivated this entire environment of nobody's above the brand, the rules should apply to everybody up to and including Brock Lesnar. Titus O'Neil gets 60 day suspension, misses WrestleMania for grabbing the boss's arm. Brock Lesnar intentionally fucking roids up, uses estrogen blockers. And here he is in the main event of SummerSlam going over in dominant fashion and a stupid fucking I'm Brock Lesnar fee fi full flum. This match is slow, boring, my two moves of doom are fucking dumb. That's exactly what the hell it is. Now you've gotten to the point with Brock Lesnar yet again, instead of him being a special attraction, he's no attraction to now we get to the point where he's the wrong attraction. The WWE kind of wants to build him like you're supposed to like him, and now you really have no reason to like him because he's a fucking drug cheat, and everybody knows it. And his matches stink now. They're all the fucking same. And at the end of the day, why the hell would I waste my time with this match just to sit there and see Orton get squashed like this? And then to sit there and do this big blood fucking finish? This was just fucking stupid. And if anything, it was the perfect culmination to this stupid fucking night. AJ Styles, John Cena... Magnificent. Cool to see Big E back. Enzo Amore in particular. Outstanding stuff. Most of the rest of this show can kick fucking rocks. And if you really, really like this show, man, you can kick rocks too, because this show sucked and you goddamn good and well know it.